Um, thank you everyone for being here. Good afternoon and welcome to our Fall 2018 Distinguished Lecture. Um, this is part of the Dr. Melvin L. DeFleur Distinguished Lecture Series sponsored by the Communication Research Center here at Boston University. Um, today we are absolutely honored to have Dr. Janet Folk, a professor of communication here from the University of Southern California. Um, Amberg School for Communication, and also Professor of Management at USC's Marshall School of Business. Um, Janet Fultz's expertise areas include information and communication technologies, international relations, new media, and organizational communication. Dr. Fultz's publications include three books, one of which won the Best Book Award from the National Communication Association in 1990, recent articles on organizations and communication technology, Non-governmental organization network have appeared in journals such as Human Relations, Communication Theory, communication, um, Human Communication Research, and Organization Science. And an award-winning article appeared in the Academy of Management Journal. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Janet Folk as our Fall 2018 Distinguished Lecture this semester.
very much a way we've been taught to think about expertise. Expertise is a possession of a person. They get it from knowledge and study and experience in a particular area. And uh, that's why we think of it as a big part of the attribute of a person. Recently in the communication literature, there's been a lot of discussion of expertise not being just in the person, but in the, in the person, what they know, but what they do. That you can't have expertise in something unless you can practice it as well as know about it. So you may read all the medical books in the world and know what they say, but if you can't go and diagnose a patient, can't prescribe the drugs, you, you can't practice expertise so you don't really have it. So there's a lot of emphasis, particularly in communication, about expertise. And of course, it's comparative. You know, Jim is more of an expert than John. And so also interesting work by Jeff Truman University of Texas. He studied public relations practitioners. And one of the things that he found in that particular field, I know there are at least some of you studying public relations here, is that expertise is very much socially constructed. Whether you think I'm an expert or not depends on what I do to try to convince you of it and what other people tell you about what I do. Though so it's very much a socially constructed a phenomenon. But despite all these kind of interesting new ways to think about expertise, it's still pretty much treated as a property of the individual. And I have a, a quote from a book that came out in 2016 by, by Trina Leonardi about communicating expertise. And it, yes, it's a property of the individual that it's inferred through communication with relative audiences. So that's our uh, kind of traditional. And here's an example of it. This is one of my favorite examples from the traditional literature is this is Collins and Evans' periodic table of expertises. I guess they're built on the periodic table of elements. And I'm not going to go through all the different quadrants uh, in this, but you'll see they talk about dispositions like, do you have interactive ability? How well can you relate to someone so that you can practice your knowledge? How well can you think about what's going on and, and then apply your knowledge and reflection and so forth? So they go through a lot of different kinds of expertise that are very um, full definition of it, um, but they're all related to the individual and the individual's practices, and this is a pretty typical uh, example. Okay, so now let's think about, okay, if, if, if we start with the premise that expertise is located in individuals and their practices, and you want to share expertise, because in this expertise economy, we've got to find it, we've got to share it, and so forth. Uh, what are some of the challenges and uh, what research has been done on these challenges? Well, three, three ones that are particularly interesting, these are illustrative, not uh, comprehensive, is obviously you've got to locate the experts. If you want to find somebody to share their expertise, you've got to locate them. Then you've got to figure out, are they really experts? Do they really know what they're talking about? Or, or are they one of Jeff Trees PR practitioners who kind of make you believe they're an expert, something that they really don't know a lot about? Okay, so you have to set the credibility. And then, if you found out a credible expert, you have to find a way to motivate them to be willing to share their expertise with you. And we have technologies that are used for, for a number of these functions. And just a really quick, I'm just gonna give you a quick review just to give you a sense of how people are looking at using technology as a way to support sharing of expertise in the expertise economy. Obviously, uh, can you even see that little picture up in the top? I couldn't tell from the back. You've got, uh, call him Sam, who's the one who needs, he needs an expert, he needs an expert knowledge on something. And so we call her Louise. And she's the one who knows, but she doesn't know him. He doesn't know her. And furthermore, um, she doesn't even know that he needs to know. So how, one of the questions that is driving a lot of this research is, how do you try to bridge that gap so that you can get this expertise shared between these people? So we find the expertise expert finding systems. These are described in great detail in a particular chapter by Merritt et al. in the Truman Economy book, and you may know some others as well, where the systems say, so-and-so is an expert on so, if you want to reach them, here's how you do it. So it's expert finding, finding systems. And the, the research that um, Merritt et al. reports say, these are pretty good, but they, oh, they're really good if you can really specifically identify a kind of technical this one had, can do this kind of software. Those tend to work better than if you have uh, less, more tacit knowledge. <laughs> so an alternative to that that there's been a lot of research on is using social search and networks. Uh, because obviously, if I can talk, go over and talk to Jim face to face, 
and we have a good conversation, we can share knowledge that is very difficult to write down, tacit knowledge, often called tacit knowledge. And obviously in networks, indirect connections, uh, I know Jim, uh, and um, Jim knows Patrice, but I don't know Patrice. So I can use Jim as a way to get into Patrice to find out uh, something that I need to know. And then a lot of these technologies have a lot of support systems, like uh, they do mapping, they can do network visualizations who talks to whom, they can do it, take a, a, a knowledge base and say that these people have in common that they know the same things or they know complementary things. And so there are a variety of different ways that um, systems can actually <coughs> visualize things about expertise and where it's located. You can assume things, you get on social media, see who's talking about uh, a particular software that you want to know something about. They're talking about it, they might be someone who knows it. So there's a lot of ways you can make inferences about expertise. So let's say you can actually locate it through looking the technology support for a commodity. How do you then assess whether you really have a credible expert? And one of the uh, one of the theories, there have been a number of theories, but one of the ones I find most interesting anyway, in trying to assess the credibility of someone as an expert is something called signaling theory. Right? And um, let me give you an example. I, I know this slide is a little bit pale, but if you can tell, that's a cheetah. People recognize the cheetah on the left-hand side, and there's a gazelle on the right. And the gazelle is doing something called stotting. Anybody know what stotting is? Okay, so the gazelle is on all four feet, and it's bouncing up and down, and up and down off the ground. Boy, really hot three, four feet. And it's doing that in the presence of the cheetah. Can you figure out why the gazelle might want to do that? Let me tell you a little bit about cheetahs. Cheetahs are the fastest animal in the world. Right? They're faster than a Porsche. Not quite as fast as the newest Tesla. But they're really fast, zero to 60 in a matter of seconds. And so if they decide to go after you, kind of prey like a gazelle, you gotta be really fast. You gotta be fast quickly because zero to 60 in a few seconds, um, you could be dinner, right? But the thing about the cheetah is once it's gone at zero to 60, it can't run very far after that. And if it doesn't catch its prey, it takes a day or two to get the energy back again to do another run. So for the cheetah, there's a lot of risk in going after the prey because if the prey, if they can't get the prey, then they're gonna go hungry for a couple of days. So why, so in that context, why might a gazelle be jumping up and down like that? Anyone have any ideas? It's not necessarily intuitive, right? Remember, the cheetah is trying to assess whether he can outrun the prey. Yeah. To show off his stamina. Exactly. For those who didn't hear, he said, show off his stamina. The gazelle is saying, I'm really fit. I'm really fast. Go ahead and try it. You won't get me. So he's kind of trying to convince the cheetah not to even try. Like the, they call this sighting. So that's a signal. The gazelle is sending a signal to the cheetah that <coughs> don't go after me. So, People in who've been studying uh, expertise have drawn on the signaling theory. Uh, there's a great uh, article by Skyrms, S K Y R M S, that takes a lot of the biological examples and translates them into human. And they have identified three kinds of symbols. Uh, one is a handicap symbol. That's something that's very expensive to produce. And it's probably really reliable. So in most cases, you would say the gazelle is saying, don't bother, cheetah. Right? Because that's very expensive to, to produce that study. Uh, so if you think about what does that mean in human systems with technological support. So if you regularly and very visibly contribute posts about a topic, social media, or enterprise uh, social networking, chances are you probably know something about it. Another kind of signal is the index signal. And uh, Judith Donut calls them assessment signals. And these are things you just 
really it's pretty much you can't do unless you really have the expertise. So if you want to uh, write an article about hierarchical linear modeling, okay, chances are you've got to know something about hierarchical linear modeling. So you get on social media and you post a reference to an article about hierarchical linear modeling. And then the kind is conventional signals, which are really easy to produce even if you don't really have the expertise. You just say what you know about the topic. So one of the things that a lot of literature is focused on, focus on is how to figure out what when someone <coughs> is sending information through social media and organizational social networking system, how credible is that as a signal of their expertise? But let's say we can find some credible experts. The next question is, how do you motivate them to be willing to share the information with you, right? And there's a, a lot of research in this area. One of them that I find most interesting, because I work in that area, is uh, information public goods theory, which is a modification of traditional public goods theory. Traditional public Goods theory talks about how do you get people to contribute to things that they become communal, communal property. Community parks, bridges, and other things when you contribute, but lots of other people get to benefit. So there's a lot of research in that. And one, one tradition of research is try to say, information is a different kind of thing than a park or a bridge, right? Uh, once you give it away, you still have it. So it's not like giving money. There are, a lot of, it, it, there are a lot of different ways that information as something that you share have, has special implications for public goods. But the basic line under, underlying premise stays the same, is that people basically will, will share when the benefits of sharing outweigh the cost of these. So it's definitely cost-benefit formula as in the traditional uh, literature. And, and then a variation of that is the notion of generalized exchange versus restricted exchange or reciprocal exchange, in that if you think about a forum, okay, let's say we want to get people to build a really effective functioning forum. Okay? So I contribute something to the forum, okay? And I'm going to pick on you again, Dr. Katz. Dr. Katz here uh, says, I like that post, so I'm going to post something as well. So that's, we agree that if he posts, I will post. So there's a reciprocation. But in many of these forums, I don't need to learn from Dr. Katz. You know, I need to learn from Patrice. So, or, or Professor Hoffinger, right? Or I need to know from someone else. So there's a norm that develops, is that if everybody contributes, everybody will learn from somebody else. So it's general. Rather than me directly exchanging with Katz, and Katz with me, I exchange with Katz, Katz with Sable, Sable with Hoffinger, and then I'm to with me. So that overall, you know, so that's a, a, a variation on this thing as well. Okay. So then the question becomes, uh, if you have organizational social networking sites, can you use them as a way to motivate people to share information? And there's been a lot of research on this, and I'm just giving you a couple of the sample findings just to give you a sense of the focus on sharing that exists in the literature. Uh, so some of the things that uh, research has found out is that you share publicly and, and in these sites, you get a reputation and that has benefits for, for you um, within uh, your organization. Uh, feedback gives you, it can be motivational. Sometimes it's easier to share rather than have to share with 30 people individually. You just push a button and it gets shared and so forth. A variety of, there's a variety of research in this area. Obviously with all kinds of downsides, right? Things like biased information getting shared, but more political information sharing and so forth. So there are a lot of negatives as well. But the main, main thing is that people say, why would people share using technology, their expertise with someone else? So that's kind of a, a quick uh, overview, as I said, not comprehensive, about kind of the traditional approach to technology support for expertise sharing. And what I'd like to, to argue is when we do when we do that kind of work, we're focusing, you know, in a network sense, we've got nodes, in this in the example here, those are people, and then we have links between those people. And we say the expertise resides in the nodes, and the links are a conduit that allow us to get expertise from one node to another. But what I like to argue is, well, what if we thought of it a little bit different way? In what way? What if we say that there not only is that expertise there, but there's also expertise in the links, 
in the relationships between the two people. What if we look at relationships? Is there a way that we can think about expertise as, as accruing to people in more than just concerns one on one? And so here are the pelicans, though this picture is actually geese. <laughs> For those who don't know much about pelicans. I live near the coast of California and I fly about it. So, um, so and the reason that uh, this intrigued me is I was I was reading an interesting story about some uh, biologists who about 15, 15, maybe 20 years ago were trying to figure out why geese that flew in a bee formation could fly so much farther than individual geese. And they couldn't figure it out. So what they did is they went to uh, a pack of geese and pelicans, actually a pack of pelicans, they're called white pelicans, down in Africa. And the researchers went and they grabbed these pelicans and they slapped hard monitors on them, okay? And then they used that technology to see what the geese did, how they moved, and what they found out is that there were really three things that made that flock of geese so much more expert at flying than any individual one. Does anybody know what? You probably can guess some of them. Yeah? Don't they rotate? Yes, rotation, okay? So think about the person in the front is there, and that person's getting all the wind resistance. The person up for, uh, and so they're gonna get tired faster than everybody else, so they rotate positions uh, within uh, the formation. They also, you could, this is why I picked the geese picture, because it's really clear, but if you look carefully at the wing position of the different geese, you see that each, each one that's in the line is at a slightly different position of the wing, because when the wing flaps down, it creates a little boost for the person behind them, and if their wing is in just the right position, um, they can fly you know, a lot more easily and use less energy. So they coordinate their wing flaps, and of course the V uh, configuration as well. And a premium of 70% is really quite substantial. So it's the relationships that the geese practice that helps them be more expert at flying, and that's how we got into this. All I got into thinking about community theory. Okay. So why would I pick community ecology theory? Well, it's a study of na in the natural world, um, and it is amazingly well documented in the natural sciences, right? And they use a wide variety of methods, from observation to uh, computational models. So it, it is a very robust literature that's mostly read by natural scientists. The other thing that I, I was attracted to about using community ecology theory is you don't need to start with the human mind and the choices that people make. You will, you can include that later when you get the humans, but you can, sometimes things are just a little clearer if you just set the cognitions aside uh, for a moment. It's also a theory that has recently been applied in the communication field very effectively. And it's inherently multi-level and includes the collective as well as the individual. So what is community ecology theory? Okay. It's a theory about the relationships of beings, animals, humans, whatever, to their environment and to each other. Okay. So it includes basically four kinds of levels. The individual, so the picture here, I think that's moose, is that a moose, all right, is the individual. Then a population would be all the, all the mooses together. And then another population would be, you know, all the cows together and so forth. So that's the next level up. And then the community is the, all the different populations that are in the same um, environment. So you have all the different kinds of animals that are, that are clustered by their species in the environment. And then the ecosystem is the product of these interactions, uh, individual to individual, individual population, 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 community, so forth, to the environment. So it's inherently multi-level. So, all right, what are some examples? How would you get from the individual to collective then? So this is a, a 
creature called an army ant. I don't know if any of you encountered them while camping, or the like, but every little ant is exactly the same, right? They all, and I have a picture, they have this, of those black tentacles, the same body type, same body shape, and they're tiny. None of them could really attack. They can't really take down a prey by themselves because they're tiny. So what they do is they swarm. They take, they're all the army ants are the same. They get together and this picture I think is um, a caterpillar, but they can get prey as large as birds just by a lot of them working together. So that's an aggregation, okay, from the individual to the collective. Uh, another type of aggregation would be uh, where you have a division of labor. With the ants, they all do the same thing, and they all have the same capabilities that you swore. Now, gray wolves are really a little bit of a different species. They, um, many of them, they have only really slight variations in capabilities, but they have a different way they divide up what jobs need to be done. And they basically, when they're after prey, they divide into two different types of groups. There's a herding group and an attacking group. So what the, um, the attacking group does is it go and hides behind a bush or in a ravine, and then the herding group goes behind the prey and chases the prey right to where the attacking group is waiting. Okay. And as a result, they end up usually um, getting their prey. So that's another type of way to get from the individual to the collector. Just as if this is an example to, to bringing up a little bit more complex model. Um, this is uh, a very well-cited, uh, kind of a standard reference for anybody who's interested in do it, looking at multiple levels of a phenomena. And this is Kozlowski's <coughs> mind, so I have to admit that the first ideas came out from Denise Rousseau in 19, actually 1985. But they, they argue that if you want to figure out how you get from an individual to a collective, from that collective to a bigger collective, you need to figure out how the aggregation or, or rules or how the rules are that uh, get them working together. So they, they come up with two different kinds of composition and compilation. Composition is perfectly the army ants. Everybody's the same. They just you get more of them in there. Then the whole swarm is more attractive, more uh, effective. But most of the other processes uh, describe other kinds of ways you can get from the individual collective. The pelicans, for example. So in the chart, it's, it, there's a beta, there's a, there's a number of different functions in there, and it just shows you it's not really a simple linear thing, just add them all up, and you get a collective. But they are in very complex ways, as we saw with a gentleman in the back who told us about the pelicans and how they have these, these rules, and the gray wolves with those rules. And so the, the key challenge then is to figure out what is the function that, that allows the collective expertise to emerge from that expertise of the individuals. And that has been a major challenge, in part because Kozlowski and Klein argue that almost all of the phenomena in organizations are compositional, which I think, as we look at more and more examples, is probably uh, a little bit of an oversight. <coughs> So here's some examples from human aggregation. You guys are familiar with wisdom of crowds, right? What is that? Anybody know what that cow weighs? Anybody remember that story? Okay, the idea was to guess the weight of a cow. This is from the 1800s. So the idea was you get a whole bunch of people to guess the weight of the cow, and then you average those. And when you average their, those guesses, you're canceling out all the individual errors of people who don't really have a very good idea. And so if you look at what they call central tendency or the mean, that you're actually gonna get a better estimate. But there are conditions under which you get a better estimate. One is the crowd has to be diverse, so they're not all thinking the same way. They have to be independent in that they're not supposed to talk with each other share ideas about what they're about, uh, the, what they think the way it is, and they should be um, decentralized as well. 
And so the weight of that cow, I'm trying to think of the exact number, I think it was 1,396 pounds. It's a pretty hefty animal, huh? And what do you think the crowd, the average of the crowd guess was? 1,394 pounds. Amazingly close. And this led to the whole uh, notion that we development of the wisdom of the crowds. Okay. So beyond wisdom of the crowds, what other kinds of relations might we look at to try to from a undergirding uh, multi-level expertise. And community ecology theory talks about four different classes of relationships, and I'll, I'd like to sort of go through them and, and give an example um, of each. The cooperative, competitive, parasitic, and symbiotic. Cooperative relationships, they're pretty obvious. They're the ones we would normally think about when we talk about collectives as being able to pull together the expertise of the individual. So uh, we got the birds, right? And, there's similar expertise, each member has the same collective. Anybody know about the Tour de France and bicycling? Bicycling contest? We think of Lance Ar Yes, uh huh. Like, are you trying to, like, you know, when they ride next to each other, they get each other with wind? Yeah. Like, they ride in packs. So. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, we think of Lance Armstrong as the expert, but, you know, he's got this whole team around him of those uh, breaking the wind forces for him and switching around and so forth. So they, they all have this bike riding expertise, but um, and the, he, he could not be an expert without them working together. Okay. So a simple example from uh, research group members. I actually have never been in a research group where everybody had the same skills, but, but if we imagine that, that would be a similar kinds of thing. Or you could be in a research group where some people are really good at coming up with the ideas, other, others are really good at the data analysis, others are really writing, and somehow or other they have differentiated, they just cooperate. Um, and I think we're all familiar with the vision of labor and honeybees, so I'll skip that one. So an example for technology-supported cooperative relationships. This is a study that was done by, by the Center for Effective Organizations at USC. I uh, was a, a minor part of it, but Jerry Ledford was the major. They, they did some research on a technical help forum in a very large um, media company where uh, the forum was totally customers. And those customers contributed 2 million posts per month. Per month. They uh, also had moderators, but the moderators were customers and they were not paid by the company. Uh, they gamified it. The company did gamify it by adding badges and uh, points for recognition and so forth. And what they found is that there was consi considerably active forum, considerable customer engagement, and they came up with a lot of creative ideas that uh, the, the company itself never would have come up on its own. In fact, in one of them, they actually noticed uh, a flaw in the rollout of a new technology that would have cost them millions of dollars. So the idea of this forum was not just cheering the expertise of course participants, but that the interaction and the question and answers would help to build expertise at the collective level. Okay, so that would be cooperative relationships. Competitive relationships. Um, I love this picture of these lions. Uh, if you think about, we, we've all read about, right? You get the headline and attach the other lions and then get to mate with the females and so forth. But there's more than that, actually, as they're competing to mate, they are individually developing these uh, fighting skills, and then the pride as a whole is developing collective uh, fighting uh, expertise. Um, so a human example. Um, one that immediately comes to my mind is a, a book called The Soul of the New Machine by Tracy Kidder. Is there anyone who has heard of this book? It was written in 1971. Not even you, Jim? Oh, you did? So people are familiar with this. Not, not these people. Oh, okay. So. That was a Rutgers That was a Rutgers, okay. So, for those of you in, you know, in the computer expertise, uh, because this took place in 1971, it was a little bit different, but the company was interested <coughs> in trying to put out a new software system, and they had two teams compete. One team was told they had to put out an 8 bit system. And another team was told they had to put out a 16-bit system. 
and that the company would uh, let both of them work, and they weren't going to automatically favor the 16, which was the newer standard. Uh, they would just go ahead and let them compete, and uh, that they would implement uh, whoever developed the best system. And they both, uh, in the process, the people who were working on it, competing through it, developed really, really good systems. They all learned a lot. The collective expertise of the organization increased a lot, and they reduced their development time by 50% by using this competition mechanism. So an example of this, uh, again, from the CEO research, in the same media company is they had a forum. They had five-person teams who were supposed to come up with innovative projects, and they were, had to work through the enterprise social network system in the company. And they did a formal pitch, and they did the kind of sharp tank kind of presentation. And, the, and one of the things they found is that this process of competing developed expertise in every <coughs> not just uh, in the individual. So that would be competitive. There's two more relationships, okay, and kind of uh, symbiotic relationships. Anybody recognize either of these two pictures? Clownfish and anemone, or Gobi and pistol shrimp? Usually somebody recognizes that clownfish and anemone. Yeah. So the clownfish lives inside the anemone because they're not stuck by it, but they like use its protection from other animals that might treat it right. Exactly. And then what does the um, what does the anemone get out of it? I know they get something. I can't remember what they are. Okay. <laughs> it, no, really. It gets protection. I'm a scuba diver, and I tell you, when I go to, down there and you're one of the clownfish and anemones, those clownfish are in my face. Get out of here. Get out of here. So it's, they're different species, but they live and work together, and this, the collective combination of to, together is uh, benefits from uh, their relationship. The goby and the pistol shrimp is a similar kind of thing. Um, I'll, I'll make this one really quick. The goby is the long, thin, white, fish with the uh, little tan bars. I'm sorry, to, it's a little light here on the screen. And underneath here is a shrimp. So that's called a pistol shrimp. It's called a pistol shrimp because it kills its prey by sound. And you can hear this when it stunnings a, a fish. And it's really loud. Um, uh, but the problem with the pistol shrimp is it's blind. So it's, you know, the only way it can detect prey is by movement of the water. So <coughs> now the goby is a really good hunter. The goby gets good food and so forth. But the goby doesn't have a place to hide because he doesn't have anything to dig with. So the pistol shrimp digs a hole, and the goby and the pistol shrimp live in the hole. If there's a predator coming, the goby whips his tail. And why would the goby whip the tail? Yes, it's okay. So it creates movement in the water that the pistol shrimp can feel because the pistol shrimp can't see. And then the pistol shrimp goes in. So together, they're a more effective unit than individually. So trying to take this idea, do we have an example of the kind of symbiosis in human multi-level expertise? Well, I tend to think of it as a, the, the QA technical form uh, as a kind of um, symbiosis. If you think of the people who ask questions and the people who answer questions as different species. This is a paper that's coming out or has come out in communication theory. Uh, first came out online in 2017. And if you look at the stats, most people who ask questions don't answer questions. Most people who answer questions don't ask questions. There are some people who do both, but most, the majority only do one or the other. And most of the research on how do you motivate people to contribute to technical forums identifies the contributors as the people who answer the questions. Those are the people who contribute to the forum. And what Big Hashadell argue is that you know the answers are useless unless they're sparked by questions, and that you have to understand that these forums would not exist without the questioners, and that the questioners and answerers have a symbiotic relationship that leads to the survival of the QA kinds of forum. Okay. Um, quickly, parasitic relationships. This one's a little bit hard. 
harder to take over to the, to the human realm, but uh, let me just give you uh, one example. I, again, the, the picture's a little bit pale, but if you look on the right-hand side, there is an ant, and it's carrying a larva, and it's taking it back to its nest, assuming it's its own child. But in fact, the a larva is the larva of a blue butterfly, and the blue butterfly doesn't feel like raising all its larvae, it wants to go out and do other things. So it, it, it's created this larva that looks exactly like the larva of the Mamika ant, and then like an ant takes it out, takes it to the nest and raises it and goes, when, it, when the, the larva turns into a butterfly, it goes, oh man, where did that come from? <laughs> and so basically the, uh, the blue butterfly is the parasite on the Mamika ant. So I think, trying to think of, uh, online examples. So there was a lot of discussion, you know, starting, you know, around the uh, turn of the century about workers and whether they were parasites because all they did was kind of watch what people were going on and didn't contribute. But some of the more recent thinking, and some of this is like we had talk, Paul Leonardi's work talked about, uh, that lurkers uh, get what he calls ambient awareness, that you don't contribute anything, but you watch what everybody else is doing. So you have big picture stuff, and so your bigger picture stuff makes you a better member of the organization, gives you have a better idea of what's going on. So that's been a little bit of a, a debate in the literature. So, okay. So I, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through here because I'm not talking too long. Uh, we talked about multi-level, talks about different types of relations that we want to study. We want to look at multi-level expertise. We talked about some of the ways to get from one level uh, to another. Uh, and we, we talked about the importance of focusing on relationships and not just individuals. And actually focusing on relationships as not being unidimensional. So I'm related to Patrice because she's my friend, but maybe there are other dimensions, other ways in which we have a kind of relationship. So if you think um, in terms of the birds, you've got the coordinated movements and you have the turn taking um, as well. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip coevolutionary theory, but we can come back to that if you want in a question and answer period. So how do you go ahead and collect multi-level expertise? Well, we talked about the pelicans with their heart monitors. There's some really interesting work that's being done now, such as by Pendlin, on wearable devices that track patterns of human communication, who talks to who, what do they do, and these devices, some of them even have um, basic biographical information so people can find other people with similar interests. There's a very, some interesting work done in that area. Obviously a lot of records of some study animals, fossil records and so forth. One of the things that I found most interesting is some recent research on the web that talks about, I, well, we all know who Albert Einstein is and his great theory, but it turns out many of his ideas came from discussions with his wife and it was the two of them talking together that the ideas, even though he ended up getting the credit for it. Um, there's, you can use in-depth observation uh, or interviews. Um, obviously, we've done that with looking at the symbiosis in the sea. And an example in the communication field is the uh, study of uh, expertise development of fresh for the next which has been about two years living with them, talking with them, observing them, writing up notes, and that's a really also a good way to um, um, start to think about multi-level expertise. Now he's done it a number of ways, but here's a really quick uh, example of what he's done with some of this ethnographic data. He, he and the contractor and Manji had developed a, a, what are called multi-dimensional network models, okay? Where it, the, the networks, right? are not just people, where we saw the people in the little X's, those are the nodes, but you could also have non-human elements. Avatars, I think some of you in here are interested in avatars, software and so forth, and that there are multiple types of, of relationships among them. And so they used uh, Leonardi's data and looked at changes in network patterns over time, and I imagine this is gonna be too small. Can you see any of this yet? Not, not too clear, I'll, I'll do my best to quickly go through it. So you, you have two different types of um, uh, nodes. The square nodes are people, and the 
circle nodes are technology. So this is a network in which there's, there are non-human elements that are nodes uh, in the network. Also, that the arrows are different types of relationships between the nodes. Uh, and it could be, I retrieved topic A, I retrieved topic B, I have expertise in topic A, and so forth. So they looked at um, these, these multiple um, levels. And basically what they concluded is that when you look at the network as a whole, you can see that there are collective elements to it that you couldn't see just by looking in a traditional network perspective. And they weren't looking at multiple multi-level expertise. This is my interpretation after they already published the paper. So um, just quickly, and then if, if anyone's interested, I'll give you more detail on one of my own studies. But mathematical and computational models have also been very, very effective. Um, one of the more interesting ones was a, a, a mathematician who figured out why penguins huddle. You know the penguins in the, right? It's, it's like minus degrees on the outside, and it's like 70 degrees in the center. And he was trying to figure out how they were able to achieve that. And so he built a mathematical model, and he compared different models, and did they produce what his measurements said about the heat? And in fact, he found that they, they, had a, a, they, they move in such a way that after X amount of time, one person who's on the outside moves in one layer, and one person who's on the very inside moves to the outer layer. And the case basically rotate through these layers so that people in front are able to maintain, the center are able to maintain 70 uh, degree temperature when it's cold outside. And that all, that was, that was only from saying, I don't know how they do it, but here I see the temperature this way. Okay, so there's a lot of other, other ways you could do um, multi-level models and analysis. And um, I think what I should do is I was going to tell you about my own study, but in the interest of time, let me say, we can move on ahead, and if you want to ask more about this uh, crowdsourcing uh, study and how it illustrated it, an interesting and somewhat different way to look at multi-level uh, expertise, uh, we can do that. So just to kind of wrap it up, since so I talked pretty long, is one of the things we might think about is what if we look at expertise that's located in relationships, I mean, the individual's functioning as a collective, and don't just imagine it's in the nodes and then the links as a, as a conduit. But imagine the relationship, they don't just communicate expertise, but they also embody expertise at the collective level. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope I left, left a few minutes for questions or more detail on the task crowd study. Yeah, we're gonna open things up for questions. Does anyone have? absolutely wonderful. Um, one question I kind of have is what happens when the organization, the categorical structure doesn't end up being so neat? So that you have individuals who are maybe part of 10 different groups which have overlapping memberships and very complicated structures. Do so the kind of strategies you're talking about still apply or do we need different ways of thinking about it to account for that kind of real world complexity that might happen with even with relatively successful people? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and it would be actually a great new direction for de uh, developing this. There's some work now going on in multi-team systems that's trying to take that into account. Some of the literature I can point you to that's very interesting is the literature on, on categories and how categories structure the way people approach the world, particularly even in, in crowdsourcing situations, that people's partial membership in different groups, okay? influences how they are perceived by those groups and how their expertise is perceived by those groups. And then people, for example, if you're in lots of different groups, that your, um, your category membership is extremely diffuse and it's harder to identify you as at your individual expertise, okay? And that the people who tend to be seen as experts, okay, tend to be associated more with a single category or a single group because the way people process information, they do it by looking for coherent categories. But, but the other side of it is within categories, they want people who are really innovative. So it's a kind of a, a contradiction. There's a lot of 
uh, literature on that in the management literature, and if you like, I'll be glad to point you toward it. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, great question. Additional questions? Could you just, in a few words, summarize your own study that you mentioned? Uh, okay, I know it. I'll just go through it real fast, if that's okay. Yes. All right. So this is a uh, study of uh, crowdsourcing community for graphic designs. And uh, there's a sample of some of the other designs. Uh, and what, what we argue is that really, we look at crowdsourcing community as a one whole, but in fact, there's lots of different collectives in there. So the example, if you can look on there, we've got um, Marta and Lee both contributed to the, was that the Dracula? No, the owl. The owl t-shirt. And Travis and Lee contributed to a different t-shirt design. Those are graphic designs for t-shirts. So each of the crowds that votes on a particular crowdsourcing is a different collective. And can we use all those different collectives to try to understand what dimensions produce better collective expertise than others? Does that make sense? Have I lost anybody yet? Okay. So we have the, some competing hypotheses. One is uh, this, actually let me tell you about the data. They're a, a trace data set from more than 200 participants and not quite 2,000 of these task crowds uh, in the crowdsourcing site. And we were quite fortunate to actually get the market sales data on, on the products. Okay, so we know how popular in terms of market sales in particular design was once it was on the market. Um, and the, we basically, we didn't f formulate it as a multi-level expertise study, but the more I think about it, it seems to fit. Is that clearly, take wisdom of crowds perspective, you have a centralized communication network that should impede performance. And this was measured by, you know, many of these sites, they don't have easy ways to communicate, so that this particular site had a forum. So people would ask, answer questions on the forum and could relate to any of the tasks, okay? So tip, if, if members of a task group had, had shown for that group of people more centralization of communication in the task forum, that should impede their ability to predict market success. And the other variable was shared task experience. So you got people who did all three of those shirts together. Is, are they better in the performance than people who have never been on the same task together. And I don't need to go into the uh, analysis, but obviously detrending and so forth. And what the study found was what Wisdom and Crowd Theory said is yes, more communication network, network centralization, <coughs> and they, they performed worse. So the idea being like felt the clocks, so they'll participate equally in configuration and uh, turn taking. At the same time, shared task experience actually ended up allowing people to form, be, perform better. Okay? The equivalent would be Pelican Flux, they were more experienced applying together in formation. Again, it wasn't a, intended to be a multi level expertise study, but looking back at it, um, it seems to have implications for that. Does that help? Sure does. So thank you for thank asking. Thank you for that yeah. summary. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Very quick, all that hard work of you and your colleagues.
is in the crowd says they should. It's, it's really unrealistic to imagine a pure wisdom of crowd situation online. <coughs> Um, cool. uh, do you know of any like studies showing um, like if there are, there's like a limit on how many experts you can have in a crowd before like there's like just too many cooks in the kitchen essentially? Um, I don't know what the number is, uh -huh. but uh, there are studies that will look at if you can achieve complete diversity, uh -huh. if you can achieve complete decentralization <coughs> and independence then like half a dozen is way too small, okay? Right. But you're, you're talking about numbers even uh, less than 100 that could be very accurate. Uh, I would need to look it up, but I'm sure there are studies. Okay. Other questions? I actually have one. Okay. Um, connecting some of the dots here, we spoke earlier about there's the multi-stage process of identifying the experts gauging their actual credibility as experts and then motivating them. And in the symbiotic relationship example, we talked about Q&A forums. Yeah. Um, we've been dismissing largely when applying, mapping uh, these ecological examples to human conditions. Again, the idea of someone removing the role of human cognition. But I'm wondering about human motivation and human emotion. So yeah. the individuals answering those questions, there isn't necessarily a utility they get per se, rather than maybe some other reward. I was wondering if you could comment more yeah. on that. No, I'm, and that's a really great question because I wasn't, uh, when I talk about this, that's the immediate response I get, well, what about people? I mean, what about what people are thinking? And you're, it's absolutely right. But my goal wasn't to leave the human out, but to start and see how much we can learn before adding human cognition. That motivation is still important. Um, I mean, well, think about, we got to, do we still have our geese up here? Oh, well, we got pelicans, they'll do, you know? You got some, you got some lazy bird, right? Right here, you know, and he's not motivated to help, right? Or <laughs> she's well, not motivated to help. Everybody else, more. and you know, they stay back where it's really easy, and then you get to the, uh, you get to the end of the flight, and they got our on it, ours on it. Like, oh, that was really fit. That person's really expert in flying, and they're not. They just weren't motivated to help out and share. So yes, 